established in 1952, the Fiordland National Park is a boundless remote wilderness and the heart of Te Wahi Pounamu, which in Terio means the place of green stones. A world heritage site in the southwest corner of the South Island, it is the largest national park in the country. It's a place where mountains, rock, ice, lakes, forests and grasslands collide with stunning beauty. Some of the best examples of animals and plants which were once found in the ancient supercontinent of Godwana, still exist here. Fjordland National Park and other nearby conservation areas offer some of the best wilderness opportunities in our Aotearoa. Shinji Kamiyama and Sanjay Thakur are rangers for DOC, the Department of Conservation which manages the park and its conservation areas and is based in the lakeside township of Tea now. This area is known all around the world for having fantastic tramping tracks. It's just amazing opportunities, whether it's from a half hour or even a five minute walk from out of the car to a three or four day fantastic alpine tramp. There's so much to do around here. Throughout the year, the centre conducts many recreational activities, presentations and events to support the half a million visitors they have annually. Apart from that, Talk is well known internationally for their species management program. New Zealand's in a unique situation with having a number of endemic, like species that are only found in this country here. And so docs had to come up with some really innovative ways of managing these species and protecting them. And more and more co um, community groups are getting involved in, in helping us to do that work. There are many hands-on frontline dock workers involved in various conservation works. The frontline workers that we have working for us do a range of different jobs. We have them working in visitor assets, so managing those tracks and huts that people are going enjoying, um, but also doing biodiversity work. Um, so we have staff who do things like pest control, killing stoats and rats and other predators, uh, and other work um, supporting our native species. So that involves things like um, supporting kiwi work, the FIO, the native blue duck, uh, also Takahe program. We have uh, the Fiordland is the home of the Takahe, the last remaining native populations of Takahe. So we have unique populations of animals based down here, like the um, doubtful sound bottlenose dolphins. So uh, we have staff out there monitoring what those uh, what those animals are up to and and looking at putting in measures to ensure their long term survival. Undertaking trapping and predator control work is Shinji Kamiyama. This coming summer is 50 years for me. Yeah, I work for a dog as a biodiversity ranger. We are currently facing big problem with rats and stoats. Yeah, and so, yes, yeah, so I want to keep special bird life in this country. So, yeah, try to get reduce the number of stoats. That's your main task for me. I want to pass on more better forest or more better bird life to next generation, yeah, include my daughter Maki. Now let's head to Dusky Sound on the wild west coast of Fiordland, where a Department of Conservation team are monitoring bottlenose dolphins. And the quickest way to get there is by helicopter. We fly over untouched landscapes which were well known to Maori, and many legends are associated with its formation and naming. Captain Cook and his crew were the first Europeans to visit Fiordland, and in 1773, spent five weeks in Dusky Sound. Cook's maps and descriptions soon attracted sealers and whalers, who formed the first European settlements of Aotearoa. We soon arrived at Anchor Island in Dusky Sound, which is used by Doc as a safe haven for the endangered birds Take or settle back and kakapo. Hello. We meet biodiversity ranger Sanjay Thakur and other dock staff, and soon on a boat, we head into the ocean to spot bottlenose dolphins. It's also an opportunity for some sightseeing of the rugged territory. This is nature at its best. What you see behind me has probably never been stepped upon by human feet. Dusky Sound as a whole, it's, it's a fantastic part of 
the country. It's, a, it's wonderful to get to work here. Uh, we, we've got forest, as you can see, getting right down to sea level, extending right up to the mountain tops. It means it's largely untouched, almost completely untouched by human influence. Uh, the marine environment itself, we've got two marine reserves here in Dusky. The dolphins, of course, that we're monitoring. You get occasional visits from uh, larger marine mammals. Orcas are occasionally seen in here. Uh, right behind us here is uh, Pigeon Island, which is, uh, was the home of Richard Henry, who uh, was the caretaker of Resolution Island from, I think it was about 1894 till for about 12 years, 1906 or so. And uh, he was one of the people who first recognised the threat that uh, stoats and other introduced predators pose to our native birds. And so he set about transferring birds like kākāpō and kiwi from the mainland onto Resolution Island, which he hoped would be a safe haven for them. Richard Henry's work was pioneering by international standards. Unfortunately, uh, stoats managed to swim out and invade Resolution Island, so it was abandoned, more or less, for many decades. Uh, now, Doc, uh, about five, four or five years ago started a project to once again eradicate re uh, predators off Resolution Island uh, with a long-term goal of reintroducing uh, kākāpō onto the island. Part of Sanjay's work is also to help eradicate predators on Resolution Island. Since we really started getting underway in 2008, uh, particularly the stoat eradication side of things, um, everything from putting in place hundreds of uh, stoat traps and then re-baiting them and checking them three times a year. Back to dolphin monitoring it is, and we cruise at about 20 knots around a large body of water. Monitoring the population of uh, bottlenose dolphins that live in Dusky Sound, they're here year round. We come out and uh, we try and explore the fjord until we run into groups of dolphins and then take lots of photos of the dolphins. So we're here for up to two weeks at a time. Uh, and we try and get out on the water every day. Sometimes, being Fiordland, the weather doesn't always play the game. Um, they tend to, at this time of year, uh, congregate in the same sort of areas. They prefer being out close to the coast because the water's a little bit warmer, we think, rather than right in the heads of the fjords where the water's colder. So, yeah, most days we're finding dolphins. Uh, we don't see all of the dolphins every day, but on a good day we'll see over, over half of the total population. There are about 125 bottlenose dolphins in the area. It's, it's a long-term study where one of the goals is to just uh, try and track the population to see if it's stable or uh, increasing or declining. And we're comparing the population of bottlenose dolphins in Dusky Sound with the doubtful sound population just to the north. These dolphins hadn't been studied at all. We knew almost nothing about them, so we're really learning from scratch. Unfortunately, we didn't spot any dolphins today, but let's have a look at some photographs Sanjay and the team took a few days ago. What we have here is the days when we do see dolphins, which is most days. We'll uh, transfer all of the photos that we've taken during the day onto our laptops and then begin the process of going through all the photos, hundreds of photos each day normally, uh, to identify the individual dolphins. The first photo I took yesterday, you can see there's a few dolphins in here. There's just one fin that's clearly visible. Can zoom right in, and you can just see there's uh, these quite unique markings along the edge of the fin. Some some will also have little uh, spots and colorations on on the main body of the fin itself. This one's got a cut. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they will almost all, as they age, um, get these cuts, and those don't really heal up. So they'll be there for life, and the, the shape doesn't really change, which means when we're coming back year after year after year, we're able to recognise the same individuals and match them up to photos that we took on earlier trips. Fascinating. Sanjay has also helped with Doc's Kākāpō recovery programme on Anchor Island. Well, yeah, for recent immigrants to New Zealand, uh, it's one of the wonderful things about living in this country is our conservation areas, the pristine environment that we're blessed to, in to inhabit and enjoy in New Zealand. And uh, I'd say the sooner that they start experiencing that, getting out and enjoying it, the more they'll enjoy their time in New Zealand. If any member of the public wants to contribute to conservation in New Zealand, the easiest way to do this would be to just visit any dock office anywhere in the country and they'll be able to give them information about volunteer opportunities and conservation projects in their area. There's a lot people can do during Conservation Week, which begins today until September the 18th. To find out more about what's happening this week, 
check out this website. Well, that's it from us for our Conservation Week special. From the newly opened New Zealand precinct at the Auckland Zoo, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week at the same time. This programme was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.